This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew Carrazzo, who is an assistant professor and joined us here at Emory in 2018 with the uh, Adult Congenital Heart Center. Uh, Dr. Carrazzo went to medical school uh, at the University of Kansas and did his internship and residency at NYU and then advanced heart failure fellowship uh, there uh, at NYU, followed by a clinical fellowship at Drexel and then adult congenital fellowship for two years at Boston Children's Mass General, where he was also the chief fellow. Uh, Dr. Carrazzo is uh, very active in the International Society for Adult Congenital Heart Disease uh, on the education committee uh, and uh, coming up with curriculum for the fellows. He's also the, on the editorial board for Jack Case Reports and serves on the ACC's uh, DNI committee. Uh, his research interests include uh, looking at biomarkers in terms of predicting risk, uh, but today he's going to be talking to us about a very important topic of caring for the LGBTQ community. Thank you, Matthew. Great, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I appreciate the appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I've chosen this topic because as a gay cardiologist, I've witnessed health disparities and discrimination firsthand. Um, as Dr. Maitha said, I currently serve as a member of the inaugural ACC Diversity and Inclusion Committee. So I'm working on changing these disparities on a national level. And my goal today with this talk is to challenge you to help make advances here at Emory. So in 2011, the Institute of Medicine put out a landmark publication that addressed health issues and research gaps and opportunities. And for those of you who haven't read it, <clears throat> I can tell you there is a whopping five paragraphs in a 366 page document that specifically concerned cardiovascular disease. There was a similar update from the National Academies of Science put out in 2020 with updated but not extensive information regarding cardiovascular disease. So where are we today? Well, currently 5.6% of Americans identify as LGBT. This is up from 4.5% in 2017, which was the last time data was gathered in a Gallup poll. Over half of all LGBT adults in the survey identified as bisexual and one in six people labeled as Gen Z, which are those born between 1997 and 2002 identified as LGBT. So we'll start with the good news. The Equality Act passed the US House for the first, excuse me, for the second time in February, 2021. For those of you not familiar, the Equality Act would provide consistent and explicit non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people across key areas of life, including housing, credit, education, public spaces and services, federally funded programs and jury service. And this would also amend existing civil rights law to explicitly include sexual orientation and gender identity as protected characteristics. The US Supreme Court ruled for workplace discrimination protections in June 2020 as well. Now the bad news. Only half of Americans live in a state with LGBT protections. And here in Georgia, we lack protections for housing, public accommodations, school anti-bullying, education, anti-conversion therapy, healthcare, and gender marker updates on identification documents. Our learning objectives for today will be to define sexual and gender minority terminology, to describe health disparities for LGBTQ plus patients, recognize LGBTQ plus cardiovascular risk factors, and review recommendations for Emory and beyond. So first starting with sexual and gender identities, there are lots of letters and for this purpose of this talk, I'll be using LGBTQ+, LGBTQ, and LGBT interchangeably. I think the easiest way to break down sexuality and gender are to frame them as a spectrum rather than a binary. So starting with the basics, <clears throat> Lesbians are women who are sexually attracted to women. Gays are men who are sexually attracted to men. 
Bisexuals are people who are sexually attracted to men and women. Transgender is a term for a person who lives as a member of one gender other than that expected based on anatomic sex. Another way to phrase it is someone uh, whose life experiences include existing in more than one gender. And some use transsexual uh, to describe them, themselves as they have transitioned or are transitioning from one sex to another. Queer is an umbrella term for sexual and gender minorities, uh, but has a history as a derogatory term and therefore it is not embraced by everyone. Questioning people are unsure or still exploring their identity and or attraction. Intersex describes someone whose combination of chromosomes, gonads, hormones, internal sex organs, and genitals differs from the two expected patterns of male or female. So in the medical care of infants, for instance, you would use DSD for differing or disorders of sex development Importantly, we do not use hermaphrodite as this is outdated and offensive. Uh, pansexual people are people uh, sexually attracted to any sex or gender identity. Um, Two-spirit is uh, a term found in Native American or American Indian culture and is used to describe a variety of ind indigenous gender identities and sexual orientations. But given that two-spirit individuals have been found in all cultures throughout history. It is not limited to just Native Americans or American Indians. Asexuals are those who have a low or lack of sexual attraction to anyone. An ally is someone who does not identify as LGBTQ, but supports their rights. And other terms, so cisgender is a term for those who identify with their gender identity that aligns with the sex assigned at birth. So for instance, I identify as a cisgender man, which aligns with my male sex. Trans is another term. So this can be specific and short for transgender or an umbrella term to describe all people who do not identify in a way that aligns with their assigned birth sex. So it can include those who describe themselves as non-binary or gender non-conforming, which is to say they do not identify with traditional social identities of male or female. And I like this graphic because it reminds us that sexual orientation and gender identity are distinct. So sexual attraction is based on who you desire. You desire men, women, everyone. Um, sex is the physical aspect of the body. Uh, so those with XX manifest a specific phenotype. Gender identity is how you feel internally about your own gender. So do you identify with what is culturally male or female? Um, and gender expression is how you present who you are to the world using culturally defined dress and behaviors. So do you wear traditionally masculine or feminine clothes or have a traditionally masculine or feminine appearance? And so if we look at one of the cookies, for example, the bisexual transgender woman, uh, she identifies as a woman as her gender, her sex assigned at birth is al aligned with XY. Um, <clears throat> her sexual attraction as being bisexual is to men and to women and she chooses to express her gender um, along a more feminine, a culturally feminine appearance. So let's meet Patty. Um, Patty uh, is a new referral for ASD closure and she needs to come to Emory to establish care. Um, but Patty was born Patrick. And while she's transitioned into her gender identity, not all of her forms or documentation reflect this. So for instance, her driver's license and insurance card still say Patrick. So let's walk through Patty's day at Emory. When she registers for the appointment, she's given binary sex options when speaking with the admin staff who fill out her demographics. When she checks in, the staff uses Patrick rather than Patty, as that is the name listed on her driver's license and insurance card. And they call, uh, call her using only the name and power chart. Um, the MA or the RN um, takes her back 
<clears throat> for the visit and they use the wrong pronouns given that all of the information in the chart says Patrick, um, but per Patty is presenting as a woman. Uh, <clears throat> they do not utilize the social history component of the chart to make any corrections. And they may question or incorrectly assume as to why she's on certain medications. Maybe she's on aldactone for hypertension rather than hormone suppression. She goes back for her echo and the echo tech also uses the wrong pronouns. Um, and they also only use the binary sex options on echo because that's all the machine will allow. You need to put in an M or an F. Now the doctor comes in and uses the pronoun wrong pronouns because they didn't ask. Um, they also don't update the social history or make notation of medications. Um, and there's also some discomfort during the exam as Patty is wearing a garment to help create or accentuate breast tissue. And this becomes awkward as the doctor auscultates her heart. And when she checks out, um, the staff doesn't use her preferred name and also uses the pronouns, wrong pronouns during the process. So overall, how likely do you, uh, do you think she's, she's going to come back to Emory? Um, how do you think Patty's day went? Is she likely to seek healthcare in the future? And I wanna turn this around a little bit. Who's asked you? How inclusive are you, your experiences? Um, how inclusive are you in your day-to-day -day practice? How often do you engage with your own patients about their sexual orientation or gender identity? Um, how often do you use gender neutral language? Um, whether it's in school, training, practice. Um, how many institutions do you know, Emory or elsewhere, that create a welcoming environment for LGBTQ plus patients, students, trainees, and staff? And I like to say that to be out is to perpetuate the process of coming out. Um, you come out to your doctors, you have to come out to your coworkers, family, friends, employers, and this is incredibly vulnerable. And it's important to keep this in mind as every single one of us has been trained to appreciate our own patients' vulnerability when they come to us for care because we address such a fundamental need for each patient. And I chose this figure because I like the continuity. I want you to think that each time a minority patient comes to you, they're coming with the idea that in order to receive complete care, they will have to let you know who they are. But they are scared or hesitant to seek care because of the discrimination or stigma they've experienced before. And it's very hard to be out and people may not cope well or easily to social stress. Now this is older data looking at teens who reported depression, PTSD, substance abuse, self-destructive behaviors and suicidal behaviors if they were not supported or were discriminated against in society by being out. And more recently, a 2020 national survey by the Trevor Project showed 40% of LGBTQ respondents considered attempting suicide with more than half of trans or non-binary youth seriously considering this. Nearly a third were homeless. A third had been physically threatened or harmed. 61% of trans or non-binary uh, respondents were prevented or discouraged from using the bathroom and 86% said recent politics negatively impacted their well-being. And when you're out, you risk discrimination in healthcare too. This is data published by Lambda Legal, which is an LGBT legal group with almost 5,000 respondents of a survey, so it's not randomized, of LGBT uh, plus uh, individuals and individuals with HIV. And here we can see that LGBT people were more likely to report being refused needed healthcare with over a quarter of trans respondents saying this. Um, providers also refused to touch or used excessive precautions during their clinical visits. They used harsh or abusive language toward the patient with trans folks reporting this at almost twice the rate of lesbians, gays, and bisexuals. And even more shocking, individuals reported their providers blamed them for their own health status. 
And here we see trans patients have the most concerns and fears, including being refused service, being treated differently, and not having access to trained providers. And while LGBT patients are concerned about accessing healthcare in 2017, the equality study actually showed that 80% of healthcare providers thought patients wouldn't disclose this information, whereas only 10% of LGBT patients within the study didn't when specifically asked. And compared to their cisgender counterparts, trans people are more likely to have to not have or miss healthcare coverage or delay healthcare due to cost. And this study uh, was to, this was a statistically significant difference between all groups um, within the study. And in a different study, around 31% of a sample of nearly 3,500 trans survey participants delayed or did not seek needed health care. And those who had to teach their providers about trans health were four times more likely to delay health care. Disparities in health behaviors and mental health can increase risk for chronic disease in sexual minority patients as they age. And here, gay, lesbian, and bisexual adults had higher odds of meeting criteria for multimorbidity than same-sex heterosexual adults at baseline. Multimorbidity included arthritis, asthma, cancer, COPD, uh, kidney disease, a coronary artery disease or angina, depressive disorder, diabetes, MI, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, stroke, and obesity. And this was true even adjusting for things like age, race, excuse me, race, ethnicity, income, education, um, healthcare coverage, healthcare delayed in the past year due to costs, and routine checkup in the past year. And this is demonstrated again recently during the pandemic. Um, the CDC uh, Multimorbidity and Weekly Report, excuse me, Mortality and Morbidity Weekly Report, reports um, that the US COVID-19 surveillance systems lack information on sexual orientation, hampering examination of COVID-19 associated disparities amongst sexual minority adults. These adults have higher reported prevalences of several underlying health conditions associated with severe outcomes from COVID-19 than do heterosexual people, both in the overall population and among racial ethnic minority groups. And here, uh, heart disease involves myocardial infarction, angina, or coronary heart disease. And the author's recommendation is that inclusion of sexual orientation and gender identity data in COVID-19 surveillance and other data collections could improve knowledge about disparities and in infections and adverse outcomes among sexual and gender minority populations overall and by race and ethnicity. And related to this, a New York Times article regarding vaccine hesitancy reported that despite being more likely to have an at-risk health condition, LGBT adults were more hesitant to undergo vaccination. Additionally, AstraZeneca and Pfizer did not ask study participants about sexual orientation or gender identity, while Moderna and Johnson & Johnson did not comment for, this, for the article. So looking at self-rated health status for gender minority and US adults, so compared to cisgender adults, they're more likely to be younger, um, non-white, uh, not married or living with a partner, um, non-English speaking, uh, without minor children in the household, but they're also more likely to report uh, poor or fair health, difficulty concentrating, being limited due to mental, uh, physical, or emotional problems. And I'd like to spend a few minutes reviewing this in detail because there's a lot to take in in the minority stress model. Um, importantly, it also gets to the heart of where the cardiovascular disparities may arise within the LGBTQ community. So if you start with um, <clears throat> your minority identity of being LGBTQ, and keeping in mind that stigma is the process of making a group of people outsiders and therefore less deserving of human rights, stigma produces minority stress, 
Um, childhood, adolescent, and adulthood trauma is common within the LGBT community. Individuals may cope with health damaging behaviors such as self-medicating with overeating, alcohol, tobacco, or other drug use. And minority stress may also produce symptoms of depression and anxiety, which may worsen such behaviors. Um, minority stress has been linked to feelings of alienation and suicide, negative self-image and self-hatred, and a variety of mental health symptoms and disorders. This is then linked to physiological factors such as autonomic nervous system reactivity, inflammation, or dysfunction of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This then manifests as cardiovascular risk factors such as obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and high cholesterol. And finally, we see results in increased cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Now, this comes from the AHA scientific statement regarding social determinants of risk and outcomes for cardiovascular disease. And here they define social determinants um, as socioeconomic position, race, ethnicity, social support, culture and language, access to care, and residential environment. And for those with poor social conditions or poor socioeconomic position or status, they tend to have increased morbidity, cardiovascular outcomes, worse cardiovascular outcomes, increased mortality, and a worse metabolic profile. And a meta-analytic review found that perceived stress was associated with a 27% increase in risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and this manifested both in endpoints such as incident MI and cardiovascular disease progression, and also risk factors such as subclinical atherosclerosis, hypertension, higher LDL, higher CRP, and behavioral risk factors such as tobacco use. Importantly, reductions in negative emotions can improve cardiovascular disease risk factor profile and disease endpoints. And depression is linked with cardiovascular disease and has been studied in coronary artery disease, heart failure, and ACHD. Um, increased inflammatory markers such as CRP in coronary artery disease and IL-6 in heart failure have been predictive of cardiovascular mortality and disease progression. Depression is linked to elevated platelet activity, uh, which is mediated by serotonin and elevated resting catecholamines. There are changes in the autonomic nervous system res resulting in reduced heart rate variability. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal dysfunction leads to alterations in cortisol response. Depression is also linked to endothelial dysfunction via the nitric oxide pathway, as well as low brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF. And interestingly, BDNF leads to angiogenesis and survival of endothelial cells. For instance, there's increased expression of BDNF during hypoxia. Um, it's also linked with cardiomyocyte death and systolic function. And overall, this cycle begets less serotonin as inflammatory cytokines are associated with increased enzymes that degrade serotonin precursor mo molecules such as tryptophan. Behavioral mechanisms such as increased burden of medication, dietary non-adherence, substance abuse, less frequent physical activity, decreased smoking cessation, and poor cardiac rehab attendance have all been linked to depression. And additionally, a recent analysis of TopCat for patients with HFPEF was notable for depressive symptoms at baseline and worsening depressive symptoms being associated with all-cause mortality. In other words, long-term cortisol elevation leads to inflammation. Uh, we get an increase in cytokines, CRP, circulating fibrinogen. This leads to vascular dysfunction uh, <clears throat> as evidenced by increased common carotid intimal medial thickness and increased coronary calcium as noted in data from the MESA study. And we then get subsequent increases in blood pressure and thrombosis risk and a reduction in blood flow. So looking next uh, at LGBTQ plus specific risk factors and disparities. 
So this is data coming from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is a nationwide surveillance system conducted by state health departments in collaboration with the CDC. And beginning in 2014, respondents could be asked about gender identity and sexual orientation. And Georgia actually participates in this. Um, here we see that, that gay and bisexual men were more likely to self-report frequent mental distress and depression, um, poor or fair health, uh, as well as activity limitations and also be currently smoking. Um, and these odds ratios are controlled for a wide variety of factors such as age, relationship status, race, ethnicity, um, education, employment, household income, health insurance, um, state of residence, as well as year. And the limitation with the study is that this is reliant upon self-reporting of cardiovascular disease. And here we see lesbian and bisexual women were more likely to report poor mental and physical health, as well as have cardiovascular risk factors such as obesity, smoking, and binge drinking. Again, the authors reported the same odds ratio controls. And again, the limitation is that this is reliant upon self-reporting of cardiovascular disease. Now, <clears throat> looking at hypertension risk factors in cisgender men, um, this is data from a study utilizing a social networking website that is popular amongst men who have sex with men. And again, we see um, use of self-reported health status. Um, but here we note risk factors for hypertension include black race, age greater than 30 with the adjusted odds ratio increasing, with each decade uh, above 30, having an associated health condition such as diabetes, um, heart disease, depression, anxiety, and being overweight. Um, for those having a primary care physician, um, they were um, those who were self-pay for insurance or had no insurance were less likely to have hypertension risk factors than those were with employer insurance. And those with employer insurance were less likely to have risk factors compared to those with Medicaid or Medicare. And for me, this begs the question, is this related to access to insurance and therefore a blood pressure machine and a provider to diagnose hypertension? And then living in the South Atlantic or Central region, um, whereas the South Atlantic is basically Delaware down the coast and South Central is Texas eastward, so basically the entire South. Um, and this may be related to states who have not expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act and therefore access to care for patients within their regions. Looking at specific risk factors for women, the authors use data from the Chicago Health and Life Experiences of Women Longitudinal Study, um, building on other data, including the Nurses Health Study, um, and found that childhood physical and sexual abuse were uh, associated with higher incidence of cardiovascular events like uh, MI and stroke. And here the risk factors include uh, elevated BMI, uh, diabetes, and hypertension. Um, childhood trauma was defined as physical and or sexual abuse and parental neglect before age 18. Adulthood trauma was defined as physical and or sexual abuse and intimate partner violence after 18. And lifetime was a combination of childhood and adulthood trauma. And the adjusted odds ratios were higher for black sexual minority women than for their white counterparts. And we've seen some of this uh, before, but here data from an analysis of the nationally represented population uh, assessment of tobacco and health study, so including waves from 2013 to 2018. And for those youth, uh, identifying as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, there were increased smoking rates. So for those coming out as LGB+, plus, um, the odds ratio is 1.72. Those who consisted, who reported a consistent LGB+, plus identity had an odds ratio of 1.45, and rates increased if they were coming out as bisexual to an odds ratio of 2.24. Additionally, data from an analysis of the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System 
showed higher odds ratios for use of e-cigarettes, cigarettes, both as well as marijuana in US adults. And looking at the differences between cis, uh, gender men and gender minorities, transgender women um, were more likely to um, not have exercised in the past 30 days as were trans men as well as gender non-conforming individuals. Trans women were also more likely to have a stroke, uh, myocardial infarction or any um, cardiovascular disease. Um, and these behaviors were adjusted for state um, survey year, age, race, ethnicity, income, education, marital status, um, em employment status, or self-rated health. And the risk factors um, were adjusted for healthcare coverage, delayed care, um, routine checkup. Um, and then reported cardiovascular conditions were, were adjusted for BMI and diabetes. In comparison to cisgender women, um, the differences are there for transgender women with regards to tobacco use, as well as trans men. Um, trans women were also less likely to have exercised. Trans women and trans men were more likely to be overweight. And trans women were uh, at higher um, risk for reporting angina or coronary heart disease, stroke, MI, or any cardiovascular disease, um, even after adjusting um, for such factors um, like BMI and diabetes. Um, trans men were also more likely to have myocardial infarctions as were gender non-conforming um, individuals in comparison to cisgender women. And so the take up home message here is that trans women and men have more cardiovascular risk factors than their cisgender counterparts. And this is an interesting topic to discuss regarding gender affirming hormone therapy. So this is a review of 13 publications regarding cardiovascular risk factors in transgender adults. And for those on female to male hormone therapies, such as formulations of testosterone, they studied the effects on a number of risk factors such as blood pressure, total cholesterol, triglycerides and HDL, and it led to mixed data on female to male regarding cardiovascular effects as some studies showed no change in risk while others showed an increase in baseline cardiovascular risk factors. And these are almost all skewed by small numbers of enrollment, a lack of randomized controlled trials, and younger ages of participants, which may translate to less time on hormone therapy. For the male to female population, venous thromboembolism risk increases 20 to 45 fold. Um, especially if on oral ethanyl estradiol, um, which is a more obsolete therapy. Uh, but this risk is mitigated by use of transdermal estrogen or, and or oral bioidentical estrogen. So attribution was given to other thrombosis risk, risk factors like smoking. Um, overall, while looking at rates of MI, TIA, and diabetes and biomarkers such as total cholesterol and HDL, the increased CVD risk overall is mainly attributable to long-term use of oral ethanyl estradiol. Um, this actually translates to an odds ratio of 1.64 for ischemic heart disease and 2.1 for cardiovascular standard mortality um, <clears throat> for those ages uh, 40 to 64 years. And this data is again skewed toward those on older hormone therapies and older women and may be determined by length of therapy. Um, and additional hormone therapy includes androgen blockers like aldactone and finasteride, as well as progesterone data, uh, therapy, progesterone therapy, excuse me. <clears throat> Data out of Emory um, looking at Kaiser patients actually shows higher rates of MI and stroke for trans feminine persons um, due to an overall higher risk of venous thromboembolism, while trans masculine rates um, were similar to reference um, cis men and women. So now let's talk about where we're going and how we're getting there. 
So what needs to be done on a macro level? I will firstly say standardization of data. Um, we need to understand mechanisms. Um, we need to elucidate potential psychosocial and behavioral targets for interventions to improve the cardiovascular health of LGBTQ plus adults. We need to design interventions and to increase knowledge to enhance the acceptability of these interventions. We need data, lots of data. Uh, we need data such as biomarkers as correlates of behavioral markers to improve outcome. We rely too heavily on self-reported data over objective data, so we do not capture the relevant sociocultural and clinical factors. We should examine how the use of gender uh, affirming hormone therapy may reduce psychosocial risk factors. We need to incorporate LGBTQ plus adults into existing research protocols and expand our own research protocols to include them. We need to identify them using standardized intake of sexual orientation and gender identity or SOGI um, so that we can actually identify who we need to study. We need to know more about social determinants of health, such as examination, uh, as, such as a full examination of the downstream health effects of discrimination. There are relationship factors, such as use of health supporting same-sex partners and families, uh, neighborhood factors, such as walkability and food access, institutional factors, such as access to and quality of interaction with knowledgeable healthcare providers and legal policy variables, um, such as legal protection and health benefits. Overall, um, sexual orientation and gender identity and intersex status are core components of identity that shape a person's daily contact with the world um, through families and relationships, jobs and healthcare, and growing up and growing older. And when we don't ask questions about these characteristics, we forgo critical information necessary for designing and implementing effective strategies, not just for closing disparities affecting specific populations, but also for providing person-centered care and services to the US population as a whole. Supposedly, we at, here at Emory are all in this together. Um, however, the 2020 score for Emory on the Human Rights Campaign Healthcare Equality Index, um, which is a national evaluation of healthcare organizations with respect to LGBTQ care, um, was a mere 55 out of 100. Um, we were dinged for lack of staff training, um, poor patient services and support, um, no trans inclusive healthcare healthcare insurance for employees, as well as no patient and communi community engagement. So we may pride ourselves for the quality care we deliver, but we also need to do a better job for the LGBTQ community, given how diverse Atlanta is. Other institutions in the South, such as UAB, Vanderbilt, and Duke do far better at engaging patients and staff to create a more welcoming environment. So what needs to be done on a micro level locally? Well, intake. Um, we ask patients how they identify beyond binary sex options. We use preferred names. It's not hard for instance, I go by Matthew, not Matt. Um, we need to incorporate sexual orientation and gender identity data into the chart under the social history and allowed for a preferred name to be used. I've been told that this is coming in epic, um, but we don't need to wait two years to document this in the chart. Um, we need to have explicit discussions regarding confidentiality, especially as it relates to younger and or less open or closeted people since full notes are available for review, um, for example, by the parents of our patients in the ACHD clinic. Um, and we can continue to use gender neutral language not only for patients, but for ourselves. Uh, with regard to signage, we can wear pronoun pins or stickers that normalize announcing our own pronouns and asking others theirs. We can put rainbow stickers on our badges to signal our openness to our patients. We can designate more single gender bathrooms here in the hospital or in clinic, or better yet, put up alternative signage that encourages people to use the bathroom consistent with their identity. 
we need to refer to other Emory clinics. Um, the gender clinic at Midtown, we're in, as well as work with our colleagues in ENT, um, plastic surgery, endocrine, and psychiatry. And also we need a curriculum of LGBTQ plus health um, for training amongst ourselves, our medical students, our trainees, and others here at Emory. I love this quote. And while I try not to read slides verbatim, um, I will for those in the car or in transit or on their phone. Um, exclusion by those at the table doesn't depend on willful intent. We don't have to intend to exclude for the results of our actions to be exclusion. If I am not aware of the barriers you face, then I won't see them, much less be motivated to remove them. I think a lot of us would say that we treat each patient with respect and that we would treat everyone the same, but we have to realize that we don't treat our patients in a cultural vacuum. I've been asked almost too many times why needing to know the sexual orientation and gender identity of our patients is important. And while I can't say now that knowing your patient is bisexual means your dose of Entresto would be higher or would make you choose a cardiac CT over a PET CT, um, I can tell you that the patient will know that you have affirmed them and that the trust you've built could be the reason why they adhere to the care plan. If we make ad advances beyond the limitations within existing research in the future, we may be able to tailor our therapies or use our risk stratification tools for a more personalized approach. It's also simply the right thing to do. What questions do you have? Thank you, Dr. Carrazzo, for that excellent presentation and a very nice review of cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Go ahead and uh, text them to me or type them in the chat or unmute and ask your questions. I'll start off with a question. Sure. Um, for transgender, uh, when there's HPA axis disruption, um, we are creating that disruption because of the testosterone or estrogen that's given, right? Mm -hmm. So in your diagram, in addition to the layer of psychosocial risk factors, I mean, is it a compounding effect? Has anybody teased that out? No, and for, that's an excellent question, and thank you for asking that. Um, but the answer is no, unfortunately. Um, the, the 13 studies that were reviewed um, looked solely at um, what biomarker data was available um, with regards to cholesterol or blood pressure or so forth. Um, but no one was able to tease out for those who were on gender-affirming therapy and for how long. Um, and no one really knows the risk factors um, that may be increased or decreased with use of testosterone um, or uh, anti-androgen therapy. Um, <clears throat> more, more research is needed to be done, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it, I think that's a key component is um, how, how do their stress levels go down when they're on gender affirming hormone therapy and that their physical appearance is consistent with their own internal gender identity. Um, the, the stress, um, the psychosocial stress component has to be less, I would imagine, um, but um, there's no, unfortunately there's no objective data um, in that regard. Great, um, there's a question from uh, Dr. Taylor. Uh, two questions. What is the experience about the willingness of patients to provide SOGI on an intake form? Um, so yeah, so like I mentioned um, in the equality study, 90% um, of patients were willing to provide that, um, whereas 80% of um, healthcare providers assumed that that would not be provided. Um, and that's actually something that I am looking at. I'm starting uh, in conjunction with other healthcare centers across this, the nation. Um, looking at response to um, being asked sexual orientation, gender identity on intake um, in a cardiovascular clinic. Um, for those of you who don't know, we here in ACHD do ask that question. Um, I can say anecdotally, it's generally well received, but um, we do have uh, specific comments that um, we're 
it is not as well received sometimes. Uh, second question, uh, did Emory change the policy regarding pronouncing pronouns or identifying pronouns? I noted this on a new patient last week. Um, to my knowledge, uh, no, but potentially, I'm, I'm not sure if that was in the chart or um, where that was documented, but I applaud whoever did document that. Um, mm -hmm. That is a question as part of our um, intake process, and we do encourage patients in ACHD. Um, there are other um, clinics um, at Emory, including family medicine and um, OBGYN that include this data as well. Um, we had to seek permission in ACHD to get um, documentation uh, that that code within the within power chart. Um, but I'm being assured by Julie Holberg um, that it will be easily available and readily available for all practitioners within Epic. Um, I'll ask another question. Um, have you uh, come across studies that uh, mention higher autoimmune uh, disorders such as I don't know, thyroid dysfunction, multiple sclerosis, lupus, psoriasis, because I was still thinking about your pathway with mm -hmm. high cortisol inflammation. And then is there immune dysfunction that's uh, higher uh, in this group? I, again, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I don't know of any data offhand. Um, looking at multimorbidity, um, there are our um, survey, it's again, it's, it's a lot of survey um, mm -hmm. or survey analysis, I should say, um, with regards to national um, data. Uh, but for those reporting, um, they often tend to have higher rates of chronic disease. Um, and so depending on how the question is, is asked upon within the survey data, um, it may capture some of those autoimmune responses, um, but we just don't have the information with regard to um, the HPA access um, and the immune response um, or uh, further endocrine responses in that regard. Uh, Pooja, I have a question. Uh, Dr. Yes. Carrazzo, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. As you know, the adults with congenital heart disease often uh, suffer childhood trauma in terms of medical trauma. And you alluded to the um, sexual orientation, gender minority community, possibly suffering childhood trauma. Is there any data looking at retention and care among adults with congenital heart disease based on um, sexual orientation and gender identity? And could these compounded traumas impact their long-term outcomes? Um, I think we found your next research study, Wendy, um, or our next research study. Um, no, if you go to... Um, PubMed and type in ACHD and sexual orientation or gender identity, you will get absolutely nothing. Um, so unfortunately there is no data um, in that regard. Uh, you would, in some of the information um, with regards to the, um, the child to trauma with in ACHD patients is thought to be compounded not just by the medical um, trauma of phlebotomy or procedures or being around physicians, um, as you know, um, but is also related to uh, uh, the burden of chronic health. Um, and so one may potentially extrapolate um, using the minority stress model that the burden of chronic health um, does cause these types of physiologic responses and therefore um, uh, manifest within higher rates of cardiovascular disease. Um, but no, I, I unfortunately don't have the answer um, to that question. But thank you. Um, there's uh, another question from uh, Dr. Parashar. Um, how early after starting hormone therapy, uh, it, you know, it, was there any, um, the duration? So, you know, what's the youngest age where mm -hmm. somebody starts sort of starting the gender affirming 
therapy because sure. the long-term outcomes may depend on how long they've been exposed. Sure. Sure. So there are studies, uh, uh, excuse me, centers that are looking at that. Um, and so those are mainly located at um, children's hospitals um, in terms of starting hormonal therapy. Um, so uh, the currently the practice is um, gender affirmation um, begins in early childhood. So as the as a child um, begins to say, you know you treat me like a boy, but I'm a girl or vice versa or whatever the case might be. Um, the parents are encouraged to uh, continue that kind of language. Um, and then uh, prior to puberty, the discussion is with the primary care physician and a pediatric endocrinologist. Um, and we do have this available at Emory um, at, through the Children's Hospital of Atlanta um, with regard to hormone blockers um, or a, a supplemental hormone therapy. Uh, <clears throat> and then duration of therapy is an interesting question because this is an ongoing discussion. Um, this is a relatively recent approach um, with regard to hormone therapy and um, teenagers or, or those who are prepubescent. Um, and um, looking at the length and exposure to supplemental hormone therapy overall. Um, now, with regard to monitoring of therapy, um, there are specific guidelines um, with regard to looking at cholesterol and blood pressure and how often you should do those. Um, and there are specific protocols that are available um, within the endocrine clinic here um, at Emory, um, if there's a gender clinic, like I said, at, at Midtown, um, and Dr. Tim Kreacha, um, who runs that. Okay, great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, if there's a, a no other questions or comments, thank you again, Dr. Carrazzo. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.